Hi everyone. So welcome back to this lesson. We're going to be talking about motions in space. Now when we talk about motions in space, what we want to do is we want to build on the material that we've kind of developed already in this particular section or in previous sections. And what we want to start identifying here is that given a position vector or a parametrization for a curve, we can call that R of t, which will then determine the position of an object traveling upon that curve. Well, that's going to be nice because if we can identify that as a position vector, then once we take the derivative of that position vector, we'll arrive at the velocity vector. And taking one more derivative from that, we're going to arrive at the acceleration vector. Now, once we're able to extract this, then we're going to say, OK, well, given this position vector, we know that we can take the derivatives, r prime and r double prime. But what about if we go backwards? What about if we are given an acceleration vector? Could we then find some position vector that we are working with? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, we definitely can. All right. So what we want to do right now is we want to kind of derive some of these equations that we're going to be working with when we're talking about motions in space. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do is we're going to use uh, Newton's second law of motion. And this one states that we're going to have our force be equal to mass times acceleration. And we're going to be using the absolute value of acceleration, which will be gravity for us. And gravity close to Earth's surface is going to be approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. And again, that's using SI units. Or if we're using gravity using the US customary system, this is going to be approximately 32 feet per second squared. So for my courses, you have to know these two constant approximations. All right, so we have to know that gravity close to Earth's surface in either metric form or in uh, the US customary form, we must know those constants. Now, back to what we're looking at. If we start looking at force as some function of t, then naturally what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to interpret that acceleration from Newton's second law of motion in terms of a, of a vector. And in this particular instance, we then get that acceleration is given by negative g in the j component. OK, so that's pretty good so far. We got that acceleration is just going to be gravity acting downward in the j component. OK, awesome. Well, what if we then integrate this? Now, when we integrate the acceleration vector, well, we're integrating just a constant in the j direction here with respect to t. Now, what's going to happen there? Well, on the left-hand side, integrating the acceleration vector, integrating the acceleration vector means taking the antiderivative for acceleration, which is velocity. So here we're going to be left with our velocity vector. Okay, and I'm going to put vector notation on here. There we are. So we're going to be left with a ve velocity vector at t. Sorry, velocity vector for t. And then on the right-hand side, since g is a constant, that's gravity. So that's going to be negative g times t in the j component. But since this is going to be an indefinite integral, we need some constant vector c. So once we have that constant vector c, then we can go through and we can start modifying this a little bit more once we start getting those values in. One of the things that we're going to notice here is that when t is equal to 0, we have initial velocity. And what we're going to do is we're going to call initial velocity is v naught. All right, so this is going to be my v naught vector. So coming over here, I'm just going to replace that now that if I have t is equal to 0, I have my initial velocity, which means I'll be able to solve for that constant. So j component plus that initial velocity. Great. Now let's start decomposing this a little bit more. If we're working on this two-dimensional 
or if we're working on this R space too, what we're going to do is we're going to start creating a simulation here, or we're going to start creating a sketch, not a simulation. Nothing's moving. Everything is static. There we go. Okay, we have some Y component. We're going to have some X component. And what we're going to do is we're going to be tracking this object as it's going to be launched from a certain point. And again, we're just tracking it. And what's going to happen here is that we're going to be looking at this initial velocity vector that we're going to launch this with. Now, if this object didn't have an initial velocity, then the initial velocity vector will just be the zero vector and we're done. However, if this does have an initial velocity, we then need to account for it. Great. So I'm actually going to move this just a little bit down because I don't like my red marker there being really close to that. Okay, there we go. That's a little bit better. Okay, perfect. So what we want to do now is we want to start decomposing this vector, this initial velocity vector. So I'm going to start decomposing this initial velocity vector into two different components. One component is going to be its vertical component. And its other component is going to be its horizontal component. So again, this vector has two different components, and we're going to identify both of them. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to identify this component as v sub uh, v sub, v naught sub x, and then its vertical component as v naught sub y. Therefore, when we're looking at the initial velocity vector, that initial velocity vector is going to be made up of those components that we just listed. V naught in the x direction, perfect. And then we're going to have initial velocity in the y component. Perfect. Now, what's really nice about this is that making our vector or deconstructing our vector into its components, we can now start identifying that there is some angle theta made with the positive x-axis here and that initial velocity vector. Now, given that angle theta, we can then start extracting our initial velocity in the horizontal component and the initial velocity in the vertical component just a little bit more. The thing that we're going to need to tie all this together is we're going to need this magnitude of this initial velocity. Now, for simplicity, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rewrite this, and I'm going to say this, that the magnitude of this initial velocity is just going to be this fancy looking V. And the reason I want this is because I'm going to be using the magnitude of velocity a lot, uh, enough that it, a lot of these notations might get lost in translation. And so we want to make sure that we stick to the process that we're knowing. And this process will actually pop out at a later time as well. So just be mindful of that. So let's go through and let's start identifying. Well, if I take my horizontal component, my v sub v not x, so if I take this component, then I know that, oops, sorry. What I want is cosine of theta. Cosine of theta is going to be the initial velocity in the x component divided by the magnitude, which we call this fancy looking v, which means that my initial velocity in the horizontal component is equal to the magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta. And very similarly, you'll be able to extract that sine of theta is going to be very, very identical to what we just listed, except we are now looking at the magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta and this is going to be the initial velocity in the y component. 
So that now gives us that our initial velocity vector can now be expressed in terms of these two components. Well, the first component is just going to be the magnitude of the uh, initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta. And the next component is going to be the magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta, given that angle for theta. So in that particular instance, we have now found that representation in component form for that initial velocity vector. So now I can go to my initial velocity vector and say, hey, initial velocity vector, I found some of your buddies here. Initial velocity, so we're going to have this magnitude of magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta. That's in the i component. And then plus the magnitude of that initial velocity vector multiplied by sine of theta. That's in its j component. Great. So now let's go ahead and let's start piecing these components together. So like components together, so we have that v of t, our velocity vector, is going to be equal to the magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta. That's in the i component. And then we have the j components, which is going to be negative g times t plus magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta. That's in the j component. So check that out. That is really amazing now. And not only is that amazing, that is actually really beneficial because now we have this velocity vector decomposed into its different components, the i and j components respectively. And what we want to do now is we want to keep arriving at that position vector. So in order to arrive at that position, what we're going to do is we're going to take the integral, oops, the integral with respect to t. Yowza, there we go. Okay, so the integral here for the magnitude of cosine of theta in the i component plus negative g times t plus magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta in the j component, this is all with respect to t. The left-hand side, well, taking the antiderivative of velocity, the antiderivative of velocity winds up in the position vector, which means we get r of t. Great, look at that. We now found r of t. But what's r of t? Well, we're integrating with respect to t. Therefore, my initial, or sorry, therefore, my x component, my first component here, is going to be magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta multiplied by t, and that's going to be in its i component. The j component, well, we're integrating with respect to t, and we already have a t here multiplying negative gravity which means we're going to have negative one half g times t squared. Sorry, I hit a dry, whoa, there's a dry spot on my computer there. Okay, so that's going to be negative one half g times t squared. There we are, plus magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta multiplied by t. And that's again in the j component. And this is an indefinite integral, which means we need plus some constant vector. In this case, we're going to call the constant vector d because we already have that initial or that uh, vector c. And so once again, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before. I'm going to say, well, you know what? I have my vector d in this particular case. And if I set t is equal to 0, then we have our initial position which we'll call r sub naught. Okay, so now let's go ahead and let's rewrite all this. Whew, this is looking real fun right now. Cosine of theta times t in the i components. And I was not being sarcastic at all. It's looking really good. t squared plus magnitude of initial velocity sine theta multiplied by t in the j component plus this initial position vector and that initial position vectors are not. Well, what does that initial position vector now represent? Well, let's go through that whole representation process. So that representation process, let's say that I had, again, my coordinate system. I'm going to extract here. Oh, Jesus. There we are. 
right? So we're gonna have our Y component, we're gonna have our X component, and say that we did not fire this object or we did not launch this object from uh, the initial coordinates origin, zero, zero. What if instead we fired or launched this object from a different coordinate system or from a different point, say that we fired it from here? Well, in that particular instance, if we fired it from there, then what's gonna happen here is that we are gonna have some Y component that we then have to worry about. That's going to be our Y naught. And we're also going to have our X component to worry about. And that component, it's going to be our X naught. Which means in this case, when I'm talking about my vector R naught, this vector is kind of determining that displacement that I am going to be observing. So there's my displacement vector. How are we being displaced from the origin? That's my vector R naught. And again, this vector R naught, in our sense, corresponds to the X component, which is X naught. Well, that looks like as X times zero. So X naught, comma, Y naught. And there we are. So now again, we found these values or these uh, components for this vector. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna substitute them in. So now my position vector magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta times t in the i component plus negative one half g times t squared plus magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta times t. And then we're gonna have this vector, that was all in the j component. This vector is going to be x naught in the i component plus y naught in the j component. Now combining all of my respective components, we can now safely arrive at this fact that we have the initial magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of t, sorry, cosine of theta multiplied by t plus the initial displacement for x, that's all in the i component, plus negative one half g times t to the power of two plus magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta times t plus y naught in the j component. Look at that, that is beautiful right there. Now, why do I say that that's beautiful? Well, because now we can extract, using our parametric equations, we can extract what is our x component, what is our y component. And before I move on, this is that vector equation that we wanna work with. And you'll see that vector equation given in your book. Sometimes they'll derive it, sometimes they won't, uh, depending on which book we might be using. Uh, some of the authors might derive it and some might not. But what we really want to focus on is that if we want to find the X component, the X component for any projectile fired under these conditions is going to be the magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta multiplied by T plus X naught. And we're also going to have that the Y component is negative one half G times T squared plus the magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta multiplied by t plus y naught. Now, these are typically called your kinematic equations when you're looking at physics, and you'll actually derive them in physics as well. So that's actually pretty cool to see. But for our instance, we wanna make sure, or for our class, we wanna make sure that we keep using these equations and not other equations that we've seen possibly in a physics class. The reason for that is we wanna make sure that we are extracting the concepts that are gonna be based upon these specific equations and not the concepts that are attached to possible different equations that you might have derived in a different course. So again, we must know these as we progress through this section. So let's see if we can work with an example really quick. And I'm gonna write this example down and by work of the internet magic, this will appear in just a little bit. All right, here we go. So here's your question that says that a projectile is fired with muzzle speed of 150 meters per second. 
and angle of elevation 45 degrees from a position 10 meters above ground level. Question is, where does the projectile hit the ground and with what speed? So in this particular instance, I always like to draw a sketch. And the sketch will basically let us know what we're looking at, what we need to abstract, and what we're kind of given to work with. So again, picture's worth a thousand words, and we want to extract each and every one of those words. So projectiles fired muzzle speed. So this muzzle speed, that's actually going to be my initial velocity there. So muzzle speed of 150 meters per second, because meters per second, that's going to be the rate. Uh, it's either going to refer to velocity or the speed. But in this particular case, it's actually going to mention that this is going to be our initial velocity. Okay, so that's going to be great. All right, so that's awesome. All right, or you can say magnitude of the initial velocity, which will correspond to that. Now, again, it's going to be launched from an angle of elevation of 45 degrees from a position 10 meters above. So there's going to be some sort of platform that it's on. And this item is then going to be fired at a 45 degree angle. So at a 45 degree angle right in here. There we go. And then it's going to travel and it's going to hit the ground at some point in time. It looks like a spider there. All right. Point of impact on the ground. Okay. So what we want to do at this point in time is, again, we want to start extracting or working with these equations. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to make all of my substitutions that I know so far. So I know that X is going to be that magnitude of initial velocity, which is going to be this 150 meters per second multiplied by cosine of my 45 degree angle times t plus my initial displacement for x but notice according to my drawing here i don't have an initial displacement for x which means it's going to be zero and we're also going to have y is equal to negative one half we're going to need gravity now gravity in terms of the SI units or in terms of the US customary, that's going to be up to us and up to the problem. Since the problem gives me meters per second and meters, uh, chances are my gravity is going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's what I wanna keep here. And then this is gonna be multiplied by T squared plus Initial velocity, that's 150 meters. I'm gonna to have to move this cheese and crackers. Okay. There we go. Sometimes I really like this copy and paste process and other times I really hate it. But for now, hey, it worked out real nice for us or for me. So then I'm gonna have a uh, sine, this is gonna be multiplied by sine of 45 degrees multiplied by T, plus in this case, I do have a vertical displacement, which was at 10 meters. Nice. So now that I have this, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna simplify as much as I can. So simplifying as much as I can for my X component, this is going to be X is equal to 150 multiplied by cosine of 45, now, cosine of 45 degrees, that's going to be root 2 over 2. So that's going to be 150 divided by 2, which should get us 75. So this is going to be 75 root 2 multiplied by t. And we're also going to have that y is negative a half times 9.8. That's going to be negative 4.9 t squared. And then this 150 times sine of 45, once again, that's going to be 75 root 2 t plus 10. Wow, look at that. That's awesome. So now we have these two equations. We have these two equations. Now we're going to go back to the question. And in the question, what they're telling us is, or what they're asking us is, when does the projectile hit the ground? So the projectile is going to hit the ground when the y component is 0. So I'm going to write on here the projectile hits the ground 
when y is equal to 0. Therefore, if we make our y component 0, we get negative 4.9 t squared plus 75 root 2 t plus 10. And we can solve using the quadratic equation. So I'm going to say solve using the quadratic equation. Now, when you use that quadratic equation, you'll be able to solve for this, and you'll get some value that is going to, or you're going to get two t values, actually. You'll get a t value, one that's going to be negative, and the other one's going to be positive, and we're going to be working with the positive version for t, which is going to be 21.74. And again, this t is representative in seconds. So 21.74 seconds after that object or that projectile was fired from that height of 10 meters from the ground from an angle of 45 degrees from the positive axis, then what's going to happen is 21.74 seconds later, it's going to hit the ground. Now, this is asking where does a projectile hit the ground and with what speed? So let's go ahead and let's make the substitution into our x component. We now have that the x component, once we make that substitution, will be multiplied by 21.74. That should get us an x value of approximately 2,306 meters. So we can go through and we can start answering that in just a bit because it's also asking with what speed did it hit. Now remember when we talk about speed. When we talk about speed, we're looking at the derivative of the position, or sorry, the magnitude of the derivative of that position function. If this, at the very, very top of your screen, that r of t, which is given by the components, the magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta times t plus x naught in the i component, so on and so forth, if that is my vector position function, then I should be able to take its derivative and then find the magnitude of that derivative to find the speed. So those x and y components that I have listed at the very top of your screen, I now need to take the derivatives for those. So let's go ahead and let's work with that. So looking at x prime, this is then going to be magnitude of v times, or magnitude of the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta we took the derivative with respect to t, therefore that's it. y prime is going to be negative g times t plus magnitude of initial velocity multiplied by sine of theta. Wow, check that out. That's not too bad. So all we need to do now in order to find this speed is to take that magnitude. So now I just want the magnitude of that position vector evaluated at 21.74 because again that's going to get us a speed at the time of impact which means my first component is just the initial velocity multiplied by cosine of theta that's just going to be my 75 root 2 squared plus second component which is negative gravity so negative 9.8 multiplied by t so that's going to be multiplied by 21.74 there we are plus initial velocity, which uh, was, oops, oh, sorry, initial velocity times sine of theta, which was 75 root 2. There we go. And this quantity is then going to be squared as such. And then to take the magnitude, all I do is take the square root of those individual squared components. Look at that, really nice and neat. Insert all of this big, uh, expression into your calculator and you will get approximately 151 meters per second. Wow. So to summarize this, the projectile will hit the ground approximately 2,306 meters from where it was fired 
from vertically. So what I mean by this is I want the distance measured from the vertical component. So the vertical component, that means if I go down here uh, to the point of impact, what was that distance? And that distance is 2,306 meters, okay? And its speed at impact is approximately 151 meters per second. And there you are. That's all ni ni nice, neat, and concise for what we're looking at here, all right, for these uh, projectile motions. Okay, so that's awesome, that's great. Now, let's go ahead and let's kind of switch gears just a little bit more. And what I wanna do is I wanna switch gears onto this acceleration vector. Now, we know the acceleration vector, that's going to be your A of T. However, this acceleration vector is actually going to be really nice in a sense that we're gonna be able to decompose this acceleration vector just a little bit more. So, what I wanna do at this point in time is I wanna look at my acceleration vector. It's going to be my A of T, okay? Now, will you agree with me that my acceleration vector was initially derived from taking the derivative from my velocity vector? Okay, so I would agree there too, yeah, sure. Great, now we're on the same track. Now, what I wanna do then is I kinda wanna get a different expression here for my velocity. Okay, so in order to get a different expression for my velocity vector here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my unit tangent vector to kind of uh, move some items around or let's say restructure some items around. Okay, so on the right hand side of your screen, I'm gonna be working with that unit tangent vector. So remember, my unit tangent vector is given by r prime of t divided by its magnitude. Well, remember, r prime, that's a derivative of the position, which means this is actually my velocity vector divided by the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay, so that's a little bit more concise way to write it. And an even more concise way to write it Remember that magnitude of that velocity that I said we were going to be working with? That was your fancy V. I know, it's, it's weird. I, I use that terminology a lot, fancy V. So we have that this unit tangent vector now in terms of its position vector can now be thought of as a unit tangent vector is equal to the velocity vector divided by its magnitude. Okay, but remember, I'm trying to get a representation for my velocity vector which means that I can multiply by the magnitude of that velocity vector onto both sides, which means that I'm gonna be left with my velocity, sorry, my magnitude of the velocity vector multiplied by tangent of t, sorry, unit tangent vector, and this is going to be my velocity vector. And this is a substitution that I wanna make here. So making this substitution now, I get my magnitude of velocity multiplied by my unit tangent vector for t. Great, look at that, that is beautiful. Now I wanna take that derivative. And actually taking this derivative is actually quite nice because since the magnitude of my velocity vector is going to be a function, a scalar function, and my unit tangent vector, this is a vector, then I'm going to be able to apply the derivative properties that we learned back in 13.1, 13.2 in order to take this derivative of a scalar function multiplied by a vector function. In this particular instance, I then need to apply the product rule once again, which means the derivative of the derivative of the magnitude of velocity multiplied by my unit tangent vector plus my magnitude of that velocity multiplied by the derivative of my unit tangent vector. That's awesome. Okay, good. Now, 
at this point in time, I want to kind of just uh, keep that steady right there. I, I want to now make a different substitution. Okay, so what's going to be the different substitution? Well, let's work with my unit normal vector. Recall that your unit normal vector is your unit derivative of the unit tangent vector divided by its magnitude. Well, in this instance, I'm not going to replace anything with fancy v, fancy t, or anything like that. So <laughs> it's OK. Now, if I want to solve for a t prime here, the derivative of the unit tangent vector, all I need to do is multiply by the magnitude of the unit tangent vector. And that's going to multiply a normal vector. Awesome. That looks really good. So now that I have this, let's go ahead and let's make that substitution into my equation over here on the left-hand side. So again, I still have a uh, magnitude of velocity derivative times the unit tangent vector plus my magnitude of the velocity multiplied by, in this instance, I now have this substitution which is going to be the magnitude of t prime of t multiplied by the normal component n of t. Great. And now at this point in time, well, let's keep working. All right. So we're going to keep working here. And what we're going to be looking for at this point in time is looking to kind of eliminate this magnitude of t prime. So how can we eliminate that magnitude of t prime? And that one's actually going to be quite nice. So that magnitude of t prime, let's see, I want to use a different color here. Let's use, uh, I want to make sure that it's not too light. Let's go with dark purple here. I'm going to use curvature. Curvature is given by the magnitude of the unit tangent vector divided by the magnitude of the position vector. But remember, the magnitude of the position vector, that was our fancy v that we we're looking at, which means this is magnitude of t prime divided by fancy v. And if we can solve for the magnitude of t prime, of t, then we get fancy v multiplied by curvature. Check that out. That is awesome. And the reason we want this now is because when we write my vector, I now have my first component stays exactly the same. However, the second component for my magnitude of t prime, that now turns into initial velocity, sorry, uh, that now turns into magnitude of initial, uh, magnitude of velocity multiplied by my curvature component multiplied by n of t. Oops, now I got the same color, cheese and crackers. Here we go. Multiplied by n times t. There we are. And this is what I want, everybody. This is what I want here. Why do I want this? Let's clean this up just a little bit. Magnitude of the velocity multiplied by unit tangent vector. Notice for the second component here, we have uh, two of those magnitudes. So two of the magnitude of the velocity. So we have a uh, V squared multiplied by curvature multiplied by normal vector. And this is where we now have that my acceleration vector my a of t is actually decomposed into two different components. The first component is going to be the acceleration in the tangential component. The second component, scalar value, is going to be the acceleration in the normal component. And this is going to be for the unit normal vector n of t. Now again, this piece of information here, we need to know this. Now, do you need to know where it was derived from? No you don't need to know where it was derived from. It's nice to know where it's derived from. However, you don't need to know it at the end of the day. However, what you do need to know is that the acceleration in the tangential component 
is going to be the derivative of the magnitude of velocity. And you also need to know that the acceleration in the normal component is going to be the magnitude of velocity squared, so the magnitude of velocity squared multiplied by curvature. So again, we do need to know these specific values that I just listed on here. All right, so again, we're looking at acceleration in the tangential component. And we're also looking at acceleration in the normal component. Now, what does this mean and why do we care about this, right? Well, I get that question a lot. So what I want to do here is I kind of want to analyze that if I have this curve that we're going to be observing and I place an object on this curve, then what's going to happen here is I can find a tangential component or a unit tangent vector as such. And I can also find a normal component. That normal component will then be in this direction. And so again, we have these two components that we found so far, unit tangent vector and this normal component, uh, this normal vector. Now, my acceleration vector, the acceleration vector, as you're moving through here, is going to be produced by this vector. And you're going to notice here that given this acceleration vector, we can kind of, kind of, kind of make this parallelogram. All right, let's actually shorten this a little bit more. There we go. We can kind of make this parallelogram here. And if we make this parallelogram, you're going to see, well, my unit tangent vector doesn't really extend all the way to the edge of that parallelogram. And the same thing for my normal unit vector doesn't extend out to the edge of that parallelogram. But if they did, then we would actually be making a component that is made, or sorry, we would be making two different components for this vector a of t that is made up of the unit tangent and the unit normal vector. Well, what if instead of saying, hey, you know, we can't do that, what if we then scale it to meet at those points? Well, that's where these scalars come into play on the left-hand side of your screen. That's what the acceleration in the tangential component is. It's going to scale that unit tangent vector in order to make sure that it is a part of your acceleration vector. And it's going to do the same thing for the scalar value in this acceleration in the normal component. It's going to make sure that your acceleration vector is then broken down into these two different components, your unit tangent vector and your normal unit vector, in order for us to extract this acceleration vector. Whew, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. So now that we have this, now that we can see this a little bit more, let's go ahead and let's work with an example here. So this example is going to say that we want to decompose the acceleration vector A of R of T, which is made up of T squared, 2T, natural log of t into tangential and normal components at t is equal to 1 half. Okay, so we have a, a lot of work ahead of us, 
And so what we want to do is we want to just make sure that we know what we're working with once we get into these uh, values. So I'm going to write a few things on the right hand side, which is going to kind of be our goal. All right, so we want to find our acceleration in the tangential component, and this is going to be the derivative of the magnitude of the velocity. And we also want a sub n, which is going to be the acceleration in the normal component. This is going to be the magnitude of the velocity squared multiplied by the curvature. Now, I want you all to remember, I want you all to remember that we said that our fancy V was really just the magnitude of the velocity vector. In other words, this was the magnitude of our prime of t. So let's not forget that. We always have to remember that as we keep going through the course. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and let's start working with that position vector. I know that we need a derivative. So here's r of t. This is going to be 2t, two, 2, and then 1 over t. There we are, looking good. Now, I need to take its derivative once again, because remember, I want to make sure that I get this curvature, and depending on how I want to work with curvature is going to depend on what we need here. Okay, so uh, let's go with our prime of, sorry, our double prime of t. And this is going to be 2, 0, and then negative 1 over t squared. Let's make some substitutions here uh, in a little bit, okay? So what I want at this point in time is I want the magnitude. So I want the magnitude of velocity. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to want the magnitude of velocity. So what I'm going to work for is the magnitude of r prime of t. Remember, this is going to be my fancy v. So that magnitude, well, I'm going to take 2 squared, sorry, 2t, and I'm going to square it. Cheese and crackers. So 2t, and I'm going to square it, plus 2 squared, plus 1 over t squared, square root of that. Wow, that's, that's, that is intense. Okay, now, naturally, this is my fancy v, right? So that's my fancy V. Now we need to take a derivative. Oh, wow, yes, I love that. Now, you, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Ready for this? Check that out. Does it factor? Yes, it does. What does it factor into? Well. And actually, sorry, here we go, there we go, perfect. Does it factor in, does it, uh, is, will it factor nicely? Yes, it will. You can try expanding this. Well, expand this using your binomial rules, then that's 2t squared, that's going to be 4t squared, plus the first term times the second term multiplied by 2, so that's 2 times 2t, that's 4t multiplied by 1 over t, that's just going to be 4, plus the last term squared, which is just 1 over t squared. Now, taking the square root of this, initial term will leave us the absolute value of that, but since t is equal to 1 half, we don't really need that, which means my fancy v turns into 2t plus 1 over t. Check that out. Like I said, that is beautiful. Now we can take this derivative without having to worry about taking the derivative previously inside that polynomial or inside of that uh, trinomial that has a square root in, uh, outside of it, which will be really nasty. So let's take this derivative now. So taking this derivative now, uh, derivative of 2t, that's just 2. Derivative here, that's going to be negative 1 over t. Look at that. That is awesome. Wow, 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 wow. All right, looking good. Let's keep going. OK, now that I have this, what I can do at this point in time. Let me just double check. I'm kind of seeing something might be off here. And okay, 
Okay. So I'm gonna trust myself, and I'm gonna keep going. All right. I'll come back if there's a, if there's a mistake there. So now that I have this, then I can go through and I can start extracting what my curvature is going to be. Okay. So let's start looking at that curvature. There we go. I found my mistake. Okay. So I told you guys, uh, I told you all something was bugging me. This is what was bugging me that, uh, my derivative here, I forgot to take the subtracting of the one from the power and therefore we get two minus one over t squared for that fancy v prime. Okay, good. Now everything's making more sense in my head. Awesome. Now let's go ahead and let's find that curvature here. Now remember curvature has two different forms and depending on which form we want is going to help us simplify this. Okay, so if I want curvature and I kind of want curvature to be a little bit nice here. Uh, I want to use curvature as, let's say, my cross product because I don't have my unit tangent vector. So if I take this as a cross product of the magnitude of r prime and r, prime, r double prime, it's going to be divided by the magnitude of r prime cubed. And remember, r prime for us is that fancy v, which means this is just the magnitude of r cross double r divided by this fancy v cubed. And if I make my substitutions in here, then everything's gonna turn out quite nice there. But in order to get there, let's go ahead and let's work with that uh, cross product first. So let's find that cross product. r prime of t cross r double prime of t. It's gonna be the i, j, and k components. There we go. So that's going to be 2t, two, 2, 1 over t, and then 2, 0, negative 1 over t squared. Okay, and we're going to have an i component. That i component is going to be negative 2 over t squared minus the j component. The j component is going to be, I get negative 2 over t minus 2 over t, and then plus the k component. The k component, I'll get negative 4. So simplifying this a little bit more, we get negative 2t squared, and that's going to be in the first component. The second component, we get negative 4t, but multiplied by negative, that's going to be positive, so that's going to be 4 over t, and then the last component we get negative 4. Okay, now I need the magnitude in order to find that curvature, so let's find the magnitude of that cross product. First component squared, that's going to be 4 over t to the fourth, plus second component squared, that's going to be 16 over t squared, plus the last component squared, we get 16. There we are. Okay, so again, we've got to try to um, simplify this if we can. And I do believe this simplifies as well. This does look like a difference of squares once again. It looks like it's 2 over t squared plus 4 quantity squared. 2 times 4 is, uh, that's 8, times 2 is going to be 16 divided by t squared. 4 squared is 16, and then 2 squared is 4 divided by t squared, 4, perfect. All inside of that square root, which means the magnitude of that cross product turns out to be 2 divided by t squared plus 4. Check that out. That is awesome. Wow. All right. I think we got everything that we need. I think we got everything that we need. Okay. Now, Let's go ahead and let's start making some substitutions, okay? Because we know we're going to need to find a sub t, the tangential component, the acceleration in the tangential component at t is equal to 1 half. So let's go ahead and let's work with that. So a sub t, and this is going to be evaluated at 1 half. 
a sub t is going to be my derivative of my magnitude of velocity evaluated at one half. And that magnitude of velocity for that derivative was this two minus one divided by one half squared. Now this is gonna turn into two minus four, which is going to get us negative two which means my acceleration in the tangential component at one half is negative two. Well, what about my acceleration in the normal component at one half? Well, that's gonna be my cross, the magnitude of my cross product evaluated at one half, divided by the magnitude of my velocity here, evaluated at one half, so that's two times one half plus one over one half as such. Okay, so that's gonna be plus one over one half, perfect. And so this, again, was my curvature, so that's my curvature, that's the first piece, or that's the second piece here, multiplied by my magnitude of velocity squared. So the magnitude of velocity squared, that's magnitude of velocity squared, so that's, or sorry, um, that's going to be two t, which is two times one half, plus one over one half quantity squared. And so I'll highlight this, that way we'll know where all this is coming from. Magnitude of velocity squared, that's magnitude of velocity squared. Then. And then we had curvature. The curvature component that we're looking at. That one. And that's this curvature here. Okay. So that's where all these uh, terms are coming from. Now we can just simplify. But look at the denominator and this function that's multiplied here, which means one of these is gonna cancel with that, or sorry, this one is cubed. Sorry, I forgot to cube this one down in the denominator, sorry. Which means my numerator up here, this is gonna be one half squared, which is one fourth. One fourth times two, that's going to be eight. So that's going to be eight plus four in that numerator divided by the denominator, one of these cancels out with two of these, or sorry, two of these cancel out with two of these down here, which means in the denominator, we're then left with two times one half, which is one, plus one divided by one half, which is two, which means we're left with 12 divided by three, which is four. So what does this then look like? Well, this then looks like my acceleration vector is going to be, or we can actually just say acceleration vector here, is going to be negative two in the tangential component plus four in the normal component, and we're done. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Whew, that is beautiful. That is awesome and amazing. So we are going to be I am gonna be asking you to work with some of these acceleration and the tangential acceleration and the normal components, and you must be able to work with these and extract these. So please make sure that you pay very close attention to the notation that was being used and you practice these sufficiently enough to make sure that you have that understanding. So I hope that you all enjoyed this lesson and I hope to see you all for the next one.